Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two, Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four-wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do-it-yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have Charlene Bauer. Yes, we've interviewed her dad, Ben Bauer, but now we're in with Charlene. Charlene and I go back quite a ways, and we'll discuss all of that. Charlene, thank you for coming on board and uh, being on Conversations with Big Rich and talking talking to our listeners. Absolutely. I'm so excited. And you and I have a lot of fun stories to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we do. I don't know if we're allowed to talk about them all. But yeah, yeah, we can talk. We can talk generalities at least. You know, I know we've we've got it. We've got to talk about your your crack kitten. You know, <laughs> but good we'll, old piston cat. Yep, yep, piston cat. The your Oroville favorite crack cat in the whole world. <laughs> yeah, the or the Oroville crack cat. Yes, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, piston was piston's a, a lovely kitty. <laughs> anyway, so let's let's go and get started like we do with everyone. And, you know, where did you grow up and, uh, you know, born and raised? Yep, I was born and raised in Palo Alto, California, which is in the Bay Area, by San Francisco area, um, with, as you mentioned, my dad, who is rad. And thank you for having him share his story. And then my mom, Deanna who's very well known as mom around camps. Um, and then my brother Brent, who is a couple of years younger than me. And I was bigger than him till he was about 11. And then I stopped having the smart mouth and realized he was bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, always, it was always an entertaining household. Let me tell you. I can imagine. I can imagine. So what were the, uh, the earliest memories well, first, let's let's before we get into those memories of of when you guys got started off roading, let's get into the basic facts of school, and you know how uh, you know what kind of student were you, you know were you athletic, were you scholastic, were you <laughs> did your own thing, where'd you fit in? I was the good student, believe it or not. You were the good. I was student. the good little student. Okay. Yes. Yep, so I went through high school playing volleyball and track, shot put and discus. Even went to the state and shot put and discus and gained a volleyball scholarship at the end. Um, And ran A's and B's through school, which really was, it was all very kind to my parents because they were like, hey, you get good grades, you do great in sports and don't worry about working, you know, we'll, we'll handle that. Um, so (laughs) until they gave me a rad van to drive around that had a 460 Ford fuel injected engine in it, uh, that was the coolest thing in Palo Alto, clearly. A van? And yes. Was it, was it multicolored and like round windows in the back? It was metallic, it was metallic blue, metallic blue and the pinstripe on it. Uh, it was like a faded red, so I convinced my dad that we had to paint it metallic pink because that was like that old school era, <laughs> 80s, 
color combo. And I'm like, dad, look at this. It's faded. We got to do something about this. Can't we just paint it metallic pink? It'll just kind of go. And he went with it. So I was fine with that. <laughs> that Don Johnson yep. in Miami Vice look. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so then uh, they realized how much fuel that was costing every day while I was going back and forth to school. So I finally got my very first ever four wheel drive, which was a Jeep Cherokee, a white one. So every time I see a white four door Jeep Cherokee running around town, I always my heart just goes out to it to have our XJ friends. Nice. Like, heck yeah. So you're not yeah, an XJ My brother hater got in then. trouble with it. I didn't. Oh, he got in trouble with it, huh? Yeah, I was the good kid. Yeah, you were the Remember, good kid. Remember, I was a good kid. <laughs> yeah, my brother and I flip-flopped that role um, in our mid-20s, but at, the, at that time, I was the good kid. Okay. <laughs> he was the wild one. <laughs> so you you, yep. you did shot put in discus and played volleyball. Volleyball is is a given because of your height. Yeah. And then no basketball? No, I'm too lazy to run up and down the court that much. <laughs> and that's why you threw, <laughs> that's why you were a thrower and not a runner. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no way. I'm like, yeah, that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but muscle and strength, you know me. Yes. That's me. Like, <laughs> yeah. So muscle and strength, working out in the weight room. I um I worked out with all the football guys. And yeah, it was great. Excellent. So what yeah. was, what were some of the good memories back then? To do with off-roading was super fun as being a volleyball in the summertime. My coach hated that I rode dirt bikes because, well, he doesn't want his athlete to get hurt riding a dirt bike and refused to let me ride dirt bikes during the season. And I don't know if you know me well enough to know you don't tell me no, right? <laughs> that means that you're going to do it. And so it just really agitated me that he was telling me that I can go ride dirt bikes in the best part of the season right there in the fall. And um, so one day, it was in August, it was during double days, and they were paving our street and you couldn't move your car out right? You're stuck with the pavement. <laughs> and so I looked at my mom and I'm like, I don't know what to do right now. I, clearly we didn't pre-plan or maybe I did a little bit. <laughs> I'm like the only way I can get to practice right now is on my dirt bike. So either I don't go to practice and I get in trouble or I pull the dirt bike out and take it, which they're dual sport bikes, right? right. They're XR6 grids that we were running 500 miles on the weekends. And so <laughs> my mom's like, whatever so i pushed it out i got it out of the trailer I put some gear on and uh, rode it up to gun high school to the gym and rup, rup, right outside the gym and parked it and my <laughs> coach came out and gave me the most awesome look i'll never forget <laughs> like are you serious right now charlene i just kind of shrugged i'm like i had no choice either i ride this or i don't come they're asphalting my street. Which one did you want? <laughs> and so that kind of eliminated this whole conversation about me dirt biking when I wanted to. It's pretty <laughs> rad. <laughs> so you went to Gun High School, huh? Yep. I, I, okay. When I was in high school, we swam against Gun. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it was always, awesome. they had a, they had an invitational or something down there. Or maybe we did mm -hmm. sectionals or something. But I remember swimming at Gun. Yeah. Nice school. Yeah, it's a nice, nice pool. Nice yeah. school. So anyway, yeah. Um, so then, you guys rode dirt bikes a lot. Where were your favorite places to ride? Uh, so we rode Hollister occasionally, just for that quick weekend, you know, quick day, quick weekend. And then our big rides were actually in Nevada. So my dad would take us over the hill and in, into Nevada with a bunch of his buddies and do two day runs. So they would always come up with some loop that they put together, uh, huge miles though, big miles, all dirt, big, big motorcycles. And off we went. Uh, he, he, yeah. He talked about, about hiding gas, gas cans. Yeah. So that you guys had enough yep. fuel. 
Or my mom would chase for us. My there mom would go. chase in the van. So we would have fuel and then have our bags at the end of the night. The same the van? That same van with the... With... No. No? No, it was okay. different. <laughs> no, that poor guy ended up with the crusher. It was such a sad day. <laughs> it was really a sad day. <laughs> so how many rows of seats did it have in it? That's the best way for me to ask. It was an old school van. It was a short, it was a short old school van. Okay. So it was, it was a Ford, but um, had the two front seats and the bench seat. And then a bed in the back. It was, I would take it to Pismo Beach all the time. You could load up your quad. I loaded up my Banshee and would go out there for the weekend with friends or whatever. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, you think back to it. Man, those things we did were not intelligent all the time, were they? <laughs> well, it... But fun. They were fun. And... Yeah. You know, they're, the thing is, is that nowadays, I really feel... I feel sorry for the youth of America nowadays. We had so many more freedoms yeah. when we were kids. And the you know, the United States has just gotten out of control and you know, you can't you can't allow kids to do the things that we did. Uh and that and that's yeah. a shame. That really is. Yeah, that's why when I do see kids out partying or you know, high schoolers out there with their truck, their XJs and stuff, and they're doing somewhat stupid things. I just laugh and let them go. Yet at the same time here, how can I help you? Right? Like, how can I help you be better right now? Because you're actually one of the ones that gets it. And I want to support that. Right. Try mm -hmm. to do that with our grandkids as they're growing up. Yeah. Cause we've been taking Jacob yeah. with us for a couple of years now on the road. And, uh, trying to expose him to, you know, driving and shooting guns and, you know, going to national parks and, you know, that kind of stuff. Things exactly. That, that he, you know, as, as a kid, as traveling, like we do, we get to let him experience. So, yeah. And I wish more kids had that opportunity. Yeah, I agree. So let's, agree. uh, let's, let's get into, into more of that, that writing um you started collecting atcs i understand <laughs> yeah that's another bad habit um when did that so start? uh that was a lot later okay i have two atc 70s that um uh, they became a cool little trend and i'm like well i want to be part of that cool little trend and so i bought two atc 70s and completely blinged them out so they're both 88 CC kits and have full paint jobs on them and everything. They're pretty aggressive. That 80s yeah. paint job again, or what kind of what kind of paint? Uh, <laughs> one is it, they're both hand painted. Okay. One is an American flag, American flag, um, American flag motif. I guess. I, what's the word for that? I don't know. Um, an American flag design. Yes. Yeah, an American flag motif, a very nice design that kind of goes across the whole fender sections. Okay. Uh, and the and tank, right? Because the tank is metal, and then the fenders are plastic. So it has to be a certain painter that can do both. <laughs> True. And then the second one, um, it's a little more aggressive. It's that hot pink with the baby blue with a bunch of Playboy bunnies on it. Ah. Not really sure where the theme came from at the time, but yeah, it's pretty fun. I didn't. I I'd seen pictures of them, and I knew that the one <laughs> was was painted that you know with the pink and stuff, and uh, but I didn't know about the Playboy bunnies on it. Yeah, you just got to zoom in a little bit. There's always there's always some interesting detail in there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so then, your uh, your XJ, what year was it? 88 four-door automatic, nothing spectacular. 88 four-door. Okay, yeah, yeah. That eight, yeah, 88s. Wait, wow, that's like one of the first years. Okay. Mm -hmm. What came after the uh, the XJ? Um, I don't I think that's when I got into truck life because that would have gotten me through college. So I went to Santa Clara University. Okay and uh, majored in marketing with a minor in communications. And during that time, I worked two to three jobs, just depending. 
So I was working at my friend's auto parts store, Service Auto Supply, and he gave me the opportunity to do all of his accounts receivable and accounts payable and all the book work and working with their inventory control management. So it, it couldn't have been a better opportunity of learning. Like he gave me the opportunity to learn books, which I have forever used in my life of learning, of knowing all of that. And then inventory control and how to get um, inventory in and out of stock and which has also been like a huge life lesson in business. I learned probably more from him than I did in college, if you put it, you know, directly in line with actual schooling. Right. Uh, and then I also worked at Zoom, Zoom Motorcycle Accessory, which was in Santa Clara, and that was the motorcycle shop. So that was my very first job ever. Oh, this is a good story. Are you ready? Yep. This, so that was the very first job ever was at Zoom Cycles and I graduated from high school and of course now you got to go get a job, right? <clears throat> and so I wanted to work at the motorcycle shop. Like, why can't I? I know everything about it and I love going down there and why don't I work at it? So I went down and I put in my resume and, you know, filled out their little application. Let's be real about it. And then they hired me. And so I was super excited. And my grandma from Bakersfield was visiting at the time. And so I went to work that day and was all excited to work at this motorcycle shop. I came home filthy from head to toe. The first day, they're like, okay, well, you get to go back and change tires all day today. That's your job. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay. And so they took me back there and one of the guys that had been working there for a while showed me the ropes and he's like, look, you do this and this and this and that. And, that. and I'm like, okay. I'd never changed street bike tire before. So that was new to me and, you know, um, weighting it correctly. Right. Right. But then the first dirt bike tire came in. I'm like, oh, this is easy. And he's like, watch this. And he put it up on this machine and bam, 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 this motorcycle tire was fixed and done and ready to go off. And I'm like, wait a second, you don't have to do it on a bucket <laughs> in the yard on the grass on your knees. <laughs> this is amazing. And they were not getting rid of me at that point. I'm like, oh, this is way cooler than changing motorcycle tires at home. <laughs> <laughs> So they couldn't get rid of me, and eventually I'm like, uh, okay, I have found out within two days, and my grandma not being happy with me coming home all dirty, that that was probably not my long-term game, and I needed to figure something else out. So You didn't I want to be a motorcycle kept... mechanic. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. And so, uh, so I kept sneaking out to the front when there wasn't a tire or something and I kept sneaking out and then I would help customers. And all of a sudden I was making these two, three hundred, four hundred dollar sales with helmets and gear and everything. And they just couldn't justify, keep throwing me to the back. So I made my way out to the front and, uh, uh, and then throughout my college career, while I continued to work there, I also made my way into their office because they needed office help as well. And so again, I learned a lot about, business and books and inventory management and everything through working there as well. Well, hands um, on and getting later, paid getting paid to learn is a great way of doing it. Oh, it like you don't and I always say this to kids, especially nowadays too, I had no idea what I was learning at the time. Right? right. I had no idea the value of what I was getting. Until later, you're like, oh, yeah, I did this and this and this. And it's all because of these people gave me these opportunities. And so as I have kids that work for me or, you know, that I see kids around me, I'm like, just take everything you can learn. And here, let me teach you how to do this. Because you may or may not need it right away. But eventually down the road, this is really going to benefit you and what you need to know. So, Perfect. yeah, it's a big life lesson. But to to finish this motorcycle shop story, I didn't learn Rich probably until 10 years later. It was a long time uh, that I was the first girl they had ever hired. Wow. And the whole deal, uh, the, the owner and the manager kept it super quiet from me until until later. And I was the first girl they had ever hired. And the only way 
they said that they would hire me is if I go through the exact same vetting process that the guys did, which was going to the back and changing tires and stuff, right? <laughs> they always vetted everybody. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, as soon as you came up smiling because you got to change a dirt bike tire on a machine instead of <laughs> instead of a bucket, we knew we were stuck with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. so that was kind of interesting. You know, you think about the where women have come into the off-road industry, and there was a moment right there where we broke a ceiling in an off-road shop. So it was pretty cool. That's that's great. That's yeah. Uh, I'm I'm glad, and hopefully they've hired women since, and hopefully those yes. women were able to change tires or learn to change tires. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's definitely girls working there after, which is cool. Excellent. So that got yeah. your start in, in sales. And where did you go after that? What were the other jobs you had in college? Um, I drove semi-trucks <laughs> in the middle of the night. So <laughs> go out and do, <laughs> yeah, this is a very unknown fact. Um, so go out in the middle of the night and do in-dump, high-side, low-boy semi-truck work. Really? So that's why when I drive big things and can back up better than I can go forward, everybody wonders why. Ah. There's a little keynote secret. That's the one where everybody said, you know, that that game everybody plays, but does nobody know about you. That's the one I use. So anybody that listens to your podcast now, I'm in trouble because that one's now out there. Yep. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so those are I pretty much I the didn't... three things I did through college. I wish I'd have known that when you were on the road with us. <laughs> yeah. right yeah because i could never get josh or i can never get shelly to drive had i known <laughs> that you could drive you would have been driving some of this yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i love it i mean that's my setup right now it's 65 feet everybody's like aren't you nervous i'm like no this is awesome Yep, that's We're good. 65 feet, you're just legal in California then. Isn't it 62.5 yeah. or 65? Anyway. I don't know. I sneak in and out of there anyways. I don't stay for long. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. try not to take the semi-truck there. I, I'll go into like when we do an event at Donner, I'll sneak into Donner and then I'll sneak, sneak in, in the back way. Yeah, sneak in the back way. <laughs> I, I don't mind going. They they. It's almost like they know me going through the trucky California truck stop. Yeah. I mean, I, I just go past the scales and then yeah. go into the semi line. And then the one time the, the, uh, the guy goes, uh, you know, bill of lading. And I said, no, no, I'm a, I'm a motor home. And they go, this is a motor home. And I said, yeah, you know, see, look at the windows, look at the propane tanks and the shitter pipes. And the guy goes, Oh, yeah, okay. You want to check it out. Pretty yeah. rad. And he goes, okay, <laughs> that's fine. He goes, Oh, by the way, you have a highway patrolman with his lights on behind you. And I'm like, okay, great. So I start to pull over, and then the the highway patrolman comes up alongside of me with his window down, and he goes, "You're good, thanks," and just takes off because <laughs> he read, <laughs> you know, he ran the plates or or you know saw that we were an RV. Yeah. And then so he let me go. Yeah. So now I just blow through there, and they never stop me. That was like the first time years ago. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Arkansas nice. is where well, I get stopped all the time. They're becoming a little more common. Yes, true. So that's helpful. So okay, so then you worked at the bike sh at the motorcycle shop and in college, right? Yeah. So I, yeah, I graduated college. Okay. <clears throat> and um, with these fancy degrees and this, you know, really nice plaque I have in my office, and thought I was going to get a real job. Um, and I was going to be a marketing professional uh, for a computer company that did inventory control management in the automotive industry, which is yeah. I was super familiar with it through working at Service Auto. And Y2K was coming up. So this is 99. I graduated in 99 from college. And Y2K was coming up. And so they hired me specifically to take on this Y2K project. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. This is going to, I mean, this is what I've been working for. I'm going to wear mini skirts and high heels to work every day and um, do this rad marketing program. 
So committed and worked through Y2K and quit. I'm like, me working in Orange County in high heels and miniskirts is not for me. <laughs> That's just about as bad as me changing tires every day. This is not going to happen. <laughs> 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 so uh, luckily through a group of my dad's friends and my friends in the motorcycle industry, I uh, got a job with the owner of Chaparral Motorsports, Dave Dameron. And uh, so I went into his office one day and he interviewed me and got a job as uh, the, the uh, mail order manager. Okay. So Chaparral Motorsports is the largest motorcycle and motorsports shop in the country and at the time and i'm still sure now but i don't know for sure as far as their their um, ship outs go but among the top of the motorcycle companies that does mail order and at the time you know mail order was a catalog goes out and you call in and you order back in 19 or 2000 now we're in 2000 we made it through y2k by the way nobody crashed yeah and uh, yeah, so I got this job, him, and did the mail order manager. And so it, my desk was right outside his office, and it stressed me out. Right, like you're answering all these, all these people's calls that are. I'm manager, so if anybody that's taking a call has a question, they have to come ask me. It's right in front of the owner's office, and this is not a small establishment. Like this is a big deal. Right. There's. 30 something people working in this mail order house. Like, oh my gosh. So one day he calls me into his office and it was within like two weeks. And he's like, uh, so I want you to go out on the floor and go walk around the shop and the store, just spend the day out there. And I just want you to come back and tell me what you see. I'm like, Okay. And so I went out and hung out in the store all day and he came back at the end of the day and he's like, well, what'd you see? <laughs> in typical Charlene fashion, I'm like, well, do you want me to tell you the truth or do you want me to tell you what you want to know? And he's like, I want you to tell me the truth. And I'm like, your parts department is not paying attention to their customers and it's very obvious and pretty challenging. He's like, sounds good. You're in charge tomorrow. <laughs> And so I became the parts manager of Chaparral Motorsports, and I had about 20 guys from the age of 16 to 65 working for me, and two girls. And for the next four years, we just made a significant difference and did all kinds of interesting and awesome things and built a wholesale department for them and all kinds of things. So, again, it was big. The whole process was big big. It was really awesome. And I learned a ton from Dave and his business strategy. And as they continued to grow their building, uh, he also gave me the accessories manager job, which was on the floor. So okay. all of the clothing, if you've ever been there, ever have a chance to stop, you just need to stop. Like it's insane how amazing this motorcycle shop is. And I, I said, I can't do it. I'm like, I can't do it. I can't be parts and accessories like it's a seven line dealership for just the side and then the accessory side is me chasing kids that are supposed to be working on the floor helping customers out of the racks from chit-chatting with their friends this is before text messaging was a thing i don't even know how they do it now <laughs> and um so I'm like yeah yeah you need to hire somebody else for that job like let me continue to be successful here so it was a great experience Chaparral was really awesome and uh, launched me into, ended up having to go back to the Bay, go back home for a couple of years. So that launched me into East Bay Motorsports, okay. which I was their parts manager there and helped out with a lot of big programs there, including hot boats. So that was, um, I ran their hot boat program and their marketing program for um, monster trucks and supercross. Oh, wow. Okay. Yep. So that was a lot of fun. So educate me, educate me <laughs> on hot boats. Hashtag never bored, right? Yeah, exactly. So educate me on, on hot boats. Are those um, the small, like, Yamaha-type 
No, no. they're the 38 foot dual oh. engine. Oh, okay. Radness. Oh, all right. Havasu style boats. Disco oh, okay. Bay. I mean, yeah. we would launch them out of Disco Bay. Okay. All right. That, yeah, makes, so, that makes sense. Yeah, the owner got into those and he's like, here, Arlene, we need to start selling these. And you're the only one that I know how to drive one. And I'm like, okay, no problem. <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> Because I just come from Southern Cal, where that was part of my lifestyle. So I'm like, all right, let's go play. Well, so, excellent. Yeah, I was taking customers out on um, out on drives so that they could see if they wanted to buy their next $200,000 boat. Buy another house. Yeah. Yeah, why not? I mean, I thought it was cool. It was a great job. <laughs> um. Was that yeah, before and, the housing downturn? Uh, yeah, we're this is still like two thousand four ish. Okay, so we're we're just about there. Yeah, so the um, uh, I also got into writing. Don't tell my mom. Shoot, if she hears this, she's gonna get mad because she never really found out. But this is also when I got into writing crotch rockets and the Jixer one thousand and everything. Okay. There's a group of girls that would run around. So. I played that little game for a minute and then I'm like, mm, this has to go away and bought my Mach 1, which you've seen. Yes. My black Mach 1 Mustang. That took over my need for having a... Something for Jixer. speed? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, so after 10 years in retail management, I said, I've had enough. Uh, if anybody who's worked retail, you absolutely understand that comment because, <laughs> the, you know, no matter what level of management you're in, when, when you're 10, at that time, $10 an hour employees call in sick, you're the one working. Yes. So it was an amazing opportunity to bank on, but it was not an amazing opportunity to live a life. And, you know, regardless of all these awesome opportunities that my bosses gave me to be successful, it was time to get out of retail. Like it, I was over it. I understand. Um, so I hate retail. Yeah. Yeah. Like I have so much respect for service managers because I was one. I'm like, Oh boy, I did that for a week and a half while my service manager was sick. And I'm like, uh uh-uh. <laughs> Nope. Never again. I will always support you. <laughs> <laughs> like nobody is happy when they call you are they he's like nope <laughs> so you learn a lot like you learn respect for different people's jobs and different people's personalities and things that happen true um which i think has made me a much better person in the bigger picture but it doesn't mean i have to do it for a living anymore right so after cust after dealing with the customers on retail side where'd you move to next yeah, so I took six months off. This oh. was the fun part. Okay. So um, during that time when I was at East Bay, uh, I had that's when I had built those two ATC 70s. Okay. I had built those up, and then my Banshee got all blinged out to match my one, the red, white, and blue ATC 70. So everything was blinged out. Everything was running great. Everything was red, but I couldn't go anywhere, right? Because I was working all the time. So I took six months off. That was my, that was my set amount of time with the money I had in the bank. Like you have to get a job. You have to figure out what you want to do in life next <laughs> within this amount of time. And so I picked up my truck to my trailer, same trailer I have today and that you always, the same trailer I had with you, but <laughs> a different truck. It was my brother's truck, the 97 F350, okay. the old body style and hooked up my truck to my trailer and I took off and went to Pismo and went here and went there, just went riding everywhere, did whatever I wanted um, and tried to figure out what I wanted to do next. So this is where the ATC 70s kind of come into play because a magazine had caught wind of them and said, Hey, we want to do an article on them. Can you meet us? And I'm like, sure you tell me when and where my schedule's wide open <laughs> so they're like meet the pismo at this day and i'm like sure no problem so out to pismo for two weeks instead of one day and hung out and um did the photo shoot with them and in typical fashion and you can appreciate this i'm like uh so this looks like a fun job 
how do you do this? How do you get into the magazine business? And they looked at me and said, you don't want to do it. Don't do it. Walk away. Run while you can. There's nothing. <laughs> right? Anybody in the magazine business is laughing too. They're like, don't do it. This it looks better than it is. Da, da, da. And I'm like, but it looks so cool. And they're like, yeah. And <laughs> Talk so about I, I didn't labor. stop. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I didn't really stop. Right. And they said, here's the deal. If you want to play, buy a camera. Here's what you should buy. And meet us in Oregon in two weeks at the Oregon Dunes. And I'm like, okay. So I bought this camera online and had it shipped to my parents' house in Palo Alto. And from Pismo, I went to my parents' house, picked up this box, never even opened it, and went to Oregon and met him in Oregon. And I showed up, and I think they were stunned. And I hand them this box that's not even open. I'm like, here, you're going to have more excitement opening this box than I am, so I brought it for you. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> for me, I don't know what it is. It's just a tool. And for them, it's like, the coolest camera they've ever seen because they were totally into it. <laughs> so that week uh, gave me the opportunity to be successful and to learn how to use the camera and to learn, you know, what to do and how to do. And there actually ended up being two magazines up there, Sand Addiction Magazine and um, Sand Sports Magazine. And Sand Sports was the one that did the article on my bikes. Well, Sand Addiction Magazine heard about me being up there and that I was interested. And now there was a battle for Charlene between these two magazines. Oh, that's always oh, like, a good thing. Are you thing. kidding me right now? I know. I know. It's quite entertaining uh, because I didn't need a job, right? Like I wasn't wanting to go back to work anytime soon. So I kind of kind of let it do its little path and – the sand addiction finally got me into an interview and it was on my way down to Glamis for Thanksgiving for two weeks. And so they interviewed me on the way there and it was pretty cool. And they were talking about this new magazine that they were going to put together. And I'm like, well, this is pretty exciting. But in the mix of it all, I'd also learned how much an editor makes. And as we both know, we have to appreciate all magazine editors. They do it for the love of the sport, <laughs> not for the money. <laughs> Very true. And I'm like, there's no, yeah, there's no way. Like, I'll take this interview, but I'm not going to do that. Well, they offered me a sales job. They offered me an ad sales job. And they said, so what do you think? I'm like, well, I'm headed out to Glamis. Let's hang out over there and I'll let you know when I get back. Because, <laughs> again, I didn't want a job. And they're like, uh, okay. So went to Glamis and came back and I said, sure, I'll take the job. This sounds fun. <laughs> and then they're like, great. Can you start next week? And I'm like, no, all my stuff's in the bay. I still have to move down here. How about I start after I get back from Christmas break and do we'll start in January. So that's how <laughs> that relationship started. <laughs> Setting your own time and, frame. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Yep. So that started um, the magazine business and really understanding editorials and photography and how to get you know, press releases in for free and how to manage those relationships with the from the media perspective and the business perspective. And then they did start a new magazine, which was Side by Side Action Magazine. And that was the very first UTV magazine that came out. So we're talking like the Rhino 450 was badass at the time, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's what we we're, yeah, that's what we were running around at, at Glamis. So there's about six of us that were probably in the the true heart of that industry growing. And a lot of people don't realize that about me because it's been kind of a past chapter. Um, yeah, all the initial UTV businesses all advertise or I worked with them to make sure that their product was out or did an article on them for side by side action magazine. Um, it was a great, great time. It was really cool. And what and years, what years was that? Was that, or what year did you so get started? So that was like 2005, 2006, 2005, okay. six, seven. Yeah. Because then 2008 happened. Right. Right. But when yeah, so, when did we first meet? Because I know it was at Sand Sports Show, and you were you were heavy into the UTV, or you knew everybody in the UTV market at that time. Yeah, so it could have been right. 
it could have been any of those years. Right. Okay. Or even after. I've been to every single one of the Sand, sand Sports Super Shows. Wow. Never missed one in 22 years now, 23 years. The only one I ever Until went to was year. that one. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's why last year was so hard. 2020 was hard for a lot of people because, like, you broke my string. <laughs> well, that and, and people didn't, all of a sudden, our schedules were, you oh, know, were just they're still screwed off up. Beat. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody's coming back better and different, and different isn't always better. Yep. But that time was a lot of fun because the, the magazine owners, it's small, right? It's not a big affiliate group. It was uh, um, individually owned. Mm-hmm. And so we all had to do a lot of jobs. So with me being an ad sales person, they would also send me out to events because I could do the ad sales, take care of the customer, and write a story and take pictures. Right. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. I got to do a lot of really cool trips during that time. Uh, I wish... Some days I really wish I had documented everything I've always done because you can hardly think back to them all, which is a great problem to have. Yes. I mean, the same thing with me with events. I mean, I've been putting on events yeah. since 2001, and there's got to be 350, 400 events that I've done, whether they're my own or somebody else's. And it's like, yeah, I can't, I can't remember all of them. Yeah. You know, in a diary would have been nice. Of course, I could have started it at any point when I thought about it, and I still don't do it. Yeah, so. I'm guilty. I'm guilty. Yep. Yeah, definitely guilty. Okay, so what? I probably should start one. <laughs> <laughs> You're still young enough. Do it. <laughs> I know. I know. With me, it's uh, nap- there's next no way. chapter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, my diary, my next diary, will start with uh, retirement sometime. That's what I'll do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. um, sand addiction. How long did that yeah, last? So, uh, sand addiction and side by side action. The magazine, right? World lasted until two thousand eight. Okay. And then the crash happened, and and it was ugly because, unfortunately, as we know in recessions, the first thing companies think they should do is cut all marketing. (laughs) I'm shrugging my shoulders right now. I know you can't see me, but. (laughs) No, I could hear it. I I knew exactly what you were doing. (laughs) Yeah. So they cut all their marketing. And when they cut all their marketing, things like magazines that are dependent on, you know, almost to the hundred percent on ad revenue goes down. And I was the salesperson and I saw this happening. So unfortunately, the writing was on the wall and I was starting to see it happen more and more and more and more. And I'm like, you know, I have two choices here. Either I look out myself and I abandon the ship before it sinks or I sink with the ship and potentially take on that reputation. And sorry to be selfish, but the only thing I have in this industry is my reputation. And I'm very conscious of that. And so I needed to make the right decision for me, which was beef. Uh, and A, I either had a better pick at trying to find another job in the industry, which was questionable at the time, or what do you do, right? right. So again, I took a little bit of time off to reflect because don't, reflect or think about what you want to do next in life when you're going a hundred miles an hour all the time. And all my friends, all my family, not all my family, but all my friends <laughs> were, <laughs> were very supportive and saying, you need to start your own business. You need to start your own business. And I'm like, but what do I do? That's, I you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to start my own business. I don't know what to do. What, what should I do? And they said, you are good enough and you're great at marketing and this is what you should do. And so I started really looking at the market and I'm always had this niche for looking at the market and understanding where the needs are, where the holes are, maybe a little bit too early, unfortunately, most of the time, but this time it worked out really well. 
And I looked at the market and I said, okay, all the magazine industry is going down. They're going to go away. Print's going to go away. The internet had been trying to be successful, but really up until that point, it was not really like the key thing everybody went to. It was just starting to be something. Like Facebook really wasn't even around yet. Right. <clears throat> MySpace was rad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody's friend Tom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But Facebook wasn't around yet. And so I started looking at it and I said, well, I have all these relationships. I know all these people that are about ready to start websites because that's what editors would go do. But they don't understand that in the Internet, you have to have fresh content every single day or you're going to be dead. Nobody's going to keep coming back. And I know how pictures work and I know how press releases work. And I also found out through the grapevine when I couldn't get press releases from companies that they were paying like $500, $800 for a press release and then having to pay somebody else for a picture. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I did what any good business owner would do. I started my own business sitting on my parents' floor trying to figure out how to use Photoshop for the first time ever and create a logo that has stuck with me for now 15 years Okay. and um, I cut the market a hundred percent. And I came in and I said, I'm going to start doing press releases and pictures for $150 who wants one and just started building it up and building it up and building it up. And that's how I started Bauer Motorsports Media is very raw, very on the gas. And You know, then it took uh, Jeff Mello introducing me to Dave Cole and Jeff Knoll, who were in now their first year of King of the Hammers. They had just had their initial one where it was just racing for beer and they were ready to take it to the next level. And Jeff's like, you need to meet this girl. You need to be a part, you know, you need to have her help you out. And so that's how I became part of King of the Hammers initially from the get go. And that ended up introducing me into the Pirate 4x4 gang and being part of Pirate 4x4 and helping out with Pirate 4x4 TV Live, which I went up there every month to organize it, co-hosted it, and um, <laughs> handled camo somehow. And then Lance <laughs> handled both of us somehow. <laughs> Lance did all the magic. I just put all the guests together and got the conversation going the way we kept needing it to go. (laughs) (laughs) Redirect, redirect. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So then that turned into that whole phase, which was a blast. I mean, every piece of my life has been a blast and so thankful for my job opportunities, Um, which also then turned me on to you and we Iraq and ended up traveling with you guys for gosh, a couple of years least yep and all kinds of comedy and chaos there <clears throat> and the crack um, cat yeah and <laughs> poor piston from oroville <laughs> <laughs> he's actually sleeping right now he's behaving himself <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean there's just there's so many great stories that go with that whole phase of bow media and and really you you're a part of it too. And you look back at that phase of off-road and four-wheel drive. I almost hate to say it, but that was the heart of it right then. There's so many things that come out of that few years of time. They're now forever involved in off-road. It's really interesting. No, you're right. It's, uh, you know, that buildup of pirate and Mm -hmm. we rock and, you know, Bauer, I mean, all of it, um, you know, really came of age, you might say. You know, we were, our yeah. events were really big before the recession, and then we had to rebuild it. Yeah. Because yeah, the recession did. just about killed us. Yeah. 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 And the and the media exposure that then we were to do through through the internet now that didn't cost us any money, right? Cost us a little bit. Um, And the videos, I I mean, 
when I started Bauer Media, I could not tell you today that, oh yeah, by the way, I have about 900 videos on my YouTube channel. Have you checked them out? <laughs> like, and I self-taught myself every single thing of that element. And here we were able to put stuff like that out. I was talking to Dean Bullock the last week. He's like, Charlene, I have no photo albums of me. The only photo album I have is the one that you made for me from King of the Hammers. And, you know, there's, there's so many amazing things that we were able to do back then with the media and the pictures and the press releases and, uh, working for Roger Norman and being his PR person while well, he rock crawled and was one of the top trophy truck drivers. I mean, these are things like you can't say in a normal sentence. And the lucky, the people that I've been able to represent from the business side as well, um, huge companies, I've been their, their social media backbone person. So I'm actually the one running their social media, but nobody knows it's me. And right. we still have it that way. So I'm still not mentioning names, but, you know, big companies that are doing that. Um, and then how I've always described my business is Bauer Media. When I built it is <clears throat> there's three there's three elements that have to make the off-road industry work. You have the companies that build the products, right? Yep. You have the racers that want the products, but they have to go off somewhere. And then you have the event series and the event series need the racers and they also need the company support as well. Right. And so what I did is I put myself right in the middle of the three and was able to work with companies like Raceline Wheels and put together an awesome support system for all their racers. And so now I'm working with all of their racers but at the same time supporting the event series while I'm on site at your event or at King of the Hammers or at you know, the desert races, at the score races and everything else so that we could be on site and actually produce that content for the drivers and the companies. And um, yeah, the hustle was real. You saw me. Oh yeah. <laughs> you saw me burning rubber on the tires. Like you're everywhere. So for about, oh geez, two three years I basically lived on the road in my trailer and truck and trailer. Yep. Kind of shadowing you most of the time. <laughs> Correct. I remember when you when you rode with us because your truck got broken into from Oh, ago. I was wondering if you're gonna bring that story up. <laughs> yeah, that was not that was that was not a that was not a Charlene happy happy story no that was probably um so that was a moment in time where i got to make a decision if i wanted to continue about media or not and there's been like two of them right okay <laughs> and that was definitely one of them and that was the one where i was on my way to oroville of all the fine places that we went and i stopped to meet with a racer and i par always parked truck and trailer in a populated area, but I had just parked it off enough apparently where somebody thought that they needed to break into it and scavenge everything it happened to be my laptops and my hard drives and all of my content that I had that I carried around. Cause I don't know, I'm weird. I always thought, well, if my, if anything starts to burn down, I'm grabbing my backpack that it has, and even to this day, I do the same thing. I'm grabbing my backpack that has my laptop in it, my purse, and my cats, and we're out. Nothing else matters, right? But the laptops and the hard drive, it's like you can't replace them. Right. So what that happened on a Wednesday, Thursday, and I was headed to the event. Lance uh, from Pirate 4x4 covered me, brought me a laptop so I could go live for Pirate that weekend during the events. And right afterwards we were headed you and Shelly and Josh and I were headed to Tennessee to go to the grand nationals. Right. Was it the grand nationals and, or was it the event after the, uh, or the tornado came through here? Uh, it was the event after the tornado. Yeah. Yeah. They just had a tornado there and I was at the bottom of my bottom Right. And I remember you like, slept for like four days. Yeah, because I took, I took, um, what did I took? I took nighttime cold medicine. <laughs> <laughs> I told Shelly, I'm like, I'm going to take nighttime pills and I'm taking 
<laughs> I'm taking Josh's bed <laughs> and just don't, don't bother me. I don't know what to do because the hustle was so hard and so extreme that that's what I needed. There's no way I could make a conscious decision unless I had had sleep. And so I took that time while you drove us across country to sleep. And I woke up when we got to Tennessee, maybe the state before. I don't know. We rebuilt. I got another laptop. I apologized to a bunch of people because they didn't have their content anymore. Right. It was awful. It was a crash. And, um, and we rebuilt and we came back and we did other cool things. And I don't know. I don't think it was long after that, that, uh, I ended up in We Rock here in Arizona. It was in a January and I, or February, the beginning of the season, the first one of the season. Yep. Congress. <clears throat> yep. Out of Congress and going down that stupid dirt road that we all hate. <laughs> the uh, back of my trailer fell apart. And so I went to, I had been helping the Let's Roll off road team with some of their marketing. And so I called and said, Hey, my trailer just fell apart. I just need it welded or something. I have no idea what's going on. Hopefully I can get it over to your edge of town. Can you help me? He's like, yeah, no problem. I'll take care of that for you. And so, uh, so he brings me to his house and which was stop at the time, parks me down their side yard, has some other friends coming in from Canada that trapped me in there. <laughs> and it took about three weeks for my trailer to get fixed while I was um, held hostage, is what I say. <laughs> held hostage in Arizona, which was not a problem because it was an amazing place to be in February. It was awesome. I was looking for a place to stop and make a home, and um, there happened to be a cute boy involved. So <laughs> I decided to stay in Arizona. Yeah. So I left here for six weeks because I had a six week trip, which was going back to LA, doing a bunch of, doing a bunch of events. Uh, we had to do something in Reno and then it was straight to Easter Jeep Safari. I don't remember all the events, but like weekend, 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 weekends. And that's how my friends would go. So halfway between um, Reno and Easter Jeep in the fine town of Elko, Nevada my <laughs> truck then blew another head gasket and I'm like I'm done so sitting in my trailer in their parking lot where they were generous enough to let me camp for the two nights while they fixed my truck and I panicked about being late for my jobs at Easter Jeep um, I rented a house site unseen in Arizona and submitted and actually had somebody come to to Moab and drive me to Arizona. I'm like, I don't even know how to get there. I don't care. I just need to be done with this right now. Get off the road. So that, I had to get off the road. <clears throat> so that's how I ended up in Arizona. Everybody's like, well, how'd you get here? I'm like, I broke down. I'm like, no, you didn't. I'm like, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I really did. you broke down in Nevada and, and ended well, up in Arizona. here first. Okay, yeah. Yeah, true. the trailer broke down here first, and then I went on that loop, and my truck broke down, and then I broke down personally. So we'll call it three breakdowns made for a for sure Arizona home base. And, and you, I love it here. It's the best decision I made. That's what I was going to say. Yep. Yeah. So then yeah. what uh, – I know you've been on the road since then, but there's a lot of story mm – -hmm between getting to Arizona and then going back on the road again. So let's talk about, about some of that time. Yeah. So during that time, uh, I, I tried a lot of different projects because essentially Bauer Motorsports Media was based around being at events, right? right? And it was taking pictures at the events, videos at the events. Well, how do I do that job when I'm not at the events? Because I am D-O-N-E with that. <laughs> And um, so it was really hard. And I luckily had a lot of friends and had always supported all the photographers that were out on course and such. And so I started subcontracting, right? And the beginning of that phase was working with other people and here I need pictures from this person, this person, this person, and I'll write the press releases and it worked out really good. But that's not a long-term game that was gonna end at some point. 
So I started the race team store, which was a store that had all the racers apparel in it. Um, I started the shirt and swag club, which then was, hey, I'm just going to send you a new shirt every month because I know how you boys weld and put holes in them all. (laughs) (laughs) And that's a funny story. That one actually got too big. And so we ended up having to shut it down because I couldn't find enough teams or or companies that wanted to play in the numbers we started to play in. So that's kind of a silly backwards story. And then I don't, I'd had, I'm not just a girl, which was my shirt and clothing line for pretty much the beginning of time since Bauer media started, but put some more effort into that and put some more designs out. So I was always just like picking at things to be really honest. And I reflect and can be honest about that. And I even started Bauer Power Hour, which was an hour-long show that we did. Um, And it was awesome. I love that phase, just like you're loving doing these podcasts. It's so fun to talk to people and hear their story. And I appreciate that. And that's what my whole business was built around, right? It was people's stories and what they're doing. So that lasted. And and then it kind of hit a challenge. And then here came the next decision. Rich, and you're probably the first one I'm telling this to publicly in a statement that is going out nationwide. Okay. I hit another wall. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I'm done writing press releases. I hate it with a passion. (laughs) Have you ever been there? Oh, yeah. You get done, you like your business, you're like, I cannot stand to write another press release. I don't want to edit another picture in my life. Like, you get to that point. Right. And it's not fun anymore. And the reward isn't there anymore. And so I wanted to quit. Right. And I wanted to quit in a big way. And I was in such a way where I even called my parents finally and said, listen, here's the deal. We're done. I'm going to go get a real job finally. And my dad and mom are like, yes, I'm sure internally. (laughs) (laughs) They're like, oh, finally, she's done goofing down. Is going to go get a real job. Uh, We all know the end result. That didn't happen. But (laughs) in the middle of how that got changed is I, I reflected on the why. And this is where I really encourage anybody that's listening right now. Like when you get to that point of, I am so done with this. Reflect on the why. Like, why am I done with this? What did I do to myself to get to this point? Because generally speaking, it has something to do with us internally. And it did. I was doing every single thing for everybody else. I was always helping other people be successful, which is not the problem. That was my job. But it was running me down in the background. And I wasn't doing anything for me. I wasn't filling my bucket back up, right? Right. Yep. There was no bucket refilling. It was just a bunch of take, 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 which again, that's my job, but we got to refill it somehow. So I made a commitment to myself. This was in 2016. I'm like, you're going to say yes to every opportunity that comes your way. Because I had been saying no. People were like, hey, why don't you come do this race? Or why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? And I'm like, no, 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 that's not me. I, you know, I make everybody look good from the backside. And so that was, um, I love that they now have a movie about the yes day. But this was a yes year. (laughs) (laughs) And so I started saying yes. And that's how uh, I got I was already a performance team member for BFG for a few years. We had won an event the year before the rally venture or tied, tied for the win, Right. which in my mind we won. I just want you to know. (laughs) 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 It was a tie based on social media. And I'm like, I don't, I don't buy it. We won. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, so we had won that the year before they asked me to come do it again. I said, Yes. And then in the same conversation, this is Richard Winchester, another one of my number one people of why I'm successful in the industry. He said, we also just signed a contract with 36 Hours You Worry. We're going to be their sponsor. And that means we can put a team in. Will you be our team? Yes. 
probably should have done some research on what that event was, but I went with it. <laughs> I'm like, yes. <laughs> and so they said, great. And I'm like, okay, Charlene, here's your chance. And so my friend uh, told me in November that she's starting this brand new event. It's going to happen in October. And it's the first time ever. And she wants me to participate in it. It's called the Rebel Rally. Would you be willing to support me in that? And we can just make this like a three event deal. And he said, yes. And I'm like, boom, there it is. All right. Now what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> so in the background, this is where, you know, that business mind didn't work out too well. In the background, I'm stopping all of my PR and marketing and shutting my business down because the next year I was going to go get a real job. And my expenses, as I decided to do these three really massive events, were going up as I was out having fun and doing what I needed to do to refill my bucket. And nobody, nobody really knew I was shutting my business down, just me and my parents and, you know, those very close to me that were affected by it. Right. So, um, yeah, so we went out <laughs> and here's another really important moment in women in off-road is right after King of the Hammers in February – the very next weekend, Emily Miller had reached out to Nina Barlow and myself and said, hey, let's go to Glamis for the weekend. I'm going to pull some girls together and let's just go out and have a good weekend and drive in sand dunes. Like nothing official, nothing big. I don't have any kind of agenda. Let's just go have fun. And Nina's like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds good. And I'd never driven a Jeep in the sand dunes. I'd don't follow me on a dirt bike, but in a Jeep, that scares me, right? <laughs> Big four-door JK. <laughs> so I told Nina, I'm like, oh, can I borrow your Jeep for a minute? Because I'm kind of scared of you. And she's like, yeah, you'll be fine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we went out to Glamis. All these girls were camp, like sleeping in these tents, and I was in my massive trailer. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you guys want a toilet? It's over here. You guys have fun in your tents out there. <laughs> I'm like, who are these people? Why are they sleeping in tents? So that right there, Rich, honestly, is the beginning of a massive era of women in motors and off-road also in this segment. And I can I can pull it back to that because from there, Emily Miller went on to be a rad owner of the Rebel Rally, right? Yep. What it is today. You're a part of it. Like, look how awesome it is. Nina Barlow is a powerhouse in the Jeep and off-road market. Myself, well, my own story keeps going, right? Yep. So... Uh, I, I asked Nina on that weekend, I'm like, Nina. Uh, and by then I also had the acceptance of the rebel rally. So Emily knew I was in and now I needed drive like co-drivers for all this stuff. So I asked Nina, I said, Nina, you want to be my partner at 36 hours? You worry, like, you know, your stuff. I know my stuff. Let's go kick some boys asses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, oh, let me look at the calendar. And she had something going on that weekend. Probably the best thing that's ever happened. <clears throat> because with her having something going on that weekend, I had to come up with a different game plan. And in the five-hour drive from Glamis back to California, I came up with this ingenious plan to have a challenge that I called... BFG on on Monday morning and says, what do you think if I run like a contest, like a challenge? Girls have to enter and then they can be my co-driver. And I said, whatever you want to do, Charlene, we're 100% behind you. So that's what was the very first ever ladies co-driver challenge. In two and a half weeks when we went out to Moab, Utah, I, I launched it at our <clears throat> first ever ladies network get together which jesse combs and i co-hosted i'm like hey jesse i'm gonna have this event you want to come hang out and be part of it and she's like yeah and i'm like sweet so that started our annual event there in moab and uh like talk about timing of everything right 
<clears throat> and so then I announced that we had 91 women from around the country enter to be our my co-driver. And luckily I had a plan of how that was all going to work out. And you needed three <laughs> co-drivers, right? I needed three. And literally, Rich, all I really wanted was 10 people to enter so I could find three <laughs> that had enough vacation time to hang out with me, right? Like, <laughs> I don't care about anything else. But, yeah, it was amazing. And I'm like, where did all these girls come from? What's happening right now? Like, how is this working? What's going on? I don't get it. And it took me a long time to figure it out, but they all want the same thing. Right. And I was very open, like, Hey, I need something. That means you all probably need something too. Let's do this together. I don't care if we win. All I care about is we do the best we can just try hard. Huh. So the, uh, <laughs> the story goes, the first event was supposed to be rally venture got canceled and so bfg instead sent us on the 2016 trail emissions with cameron steel which is now an abc special so you can look that up and watch that it's pretty oh, nice. awesome yes and so that got us introduced pretty fast with what we were doing out and about and then uh, the second event was 36 hours of Uri, which is north carolina in august for 36 hours straight of winching heat, heat and humidity. building bridges <laughs> yeah <laughs> and physical activity on top of it remember that i don't like to run part <laughs> <laughs> or paddle <laughs> and uh, yeah i had to learn how to canoe i learned how to canoe on the grass an hour before we were canoeing like i've never canoed before <laughs> <laughs> and I had to take the canoe on and off this dang jeep multiple times. Like, yeah, it was it was sincerely aggressive. Um, we ended up taking second in the pro class between oh, nice. behind Casey Curry and Warren Anderson. So I'll take that second place all day long, right? Absolutely. Yeah, those those two together are are a machine. Um, and then and and these are with with contest winners right again just girls right just girls not handpicked nothing that and just girls girls wanting to live their life and all i asked is we did the best we could <clears throat> so we're coming into october and october is always a month for understanding when the you know um when the contracts are coming out for the next year right for a business yep and SEMA comes in November and, and so forth. And so around the end of September, I started letting some of my key people know that, hey, listen, I'm shutting Bauer Media down, and I appreciate you very much, but please don't suggest me to anybody. Like, I don't want to have to tell them no. Just, just don't even bring my name up. So Barbara Rainey was one of my calls, and I told her this. And I says, yeah, I'm going to shut it down. And she's like, you know, Charlene, you just need to take a deep breath. You just need to breathe. Typical I'm like, Barbara. Are you serious right now? I'm like, no. Right? I'm like, are you serious right now? You're telling me to breathe? I've been breathing for years and this is not working out anymore. We're done. I made a decision. I'm having a great year. We're having we're living life. I'm gonna go get a real job. Which by the way, my real job was working at Coldstone in their marketing department. Oh really? headquarters yeah their headquarters is down the street one oh. day i might actually work there we'll see but... <laughs> that was what you were going to do <laughs> oh yeah okay. yeah that was my goal job mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so she just told me to breathe she's like why don't you just breathe for a couple of weeks I'm like okay whatever i i mean i've been breathing we're good <clears throat> so we're prepping for the rebel rally and getting everything together and getting it going uh, which is quite the feat in itself. And so two weeks later, uh, Barbara calls me and she says, hi, Charlene, this is Barbara Rainey calling on behalf of the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame. And I'd like to let you know that you've been nominated as the rising star in the industry category. And I'm like, are you serious right now? And she's like, yes. I'm like, did you know this two weeks ago? She's like, yes. I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, now what do I do? 
right? Yep. And so I called my parents and I said, I got good news and bad news. Which one do you want? And I always make my parents talk to me at the same time because I only have to talk, tell the story once. So my mom, of course, she's like, oh, it's the good news. So I said the good news of getting the nomination, which is amazing. That's, you've been on that. You've been on the docket. Like, yep. it's an amazing feeling, right, to be even looked at by industry peers, much less on that list. I'm like, holy cow. So I guess what I've been doing is making something worth of a difference. And then my dad's like, well, what's the bad news? I'm like, what am I supposed to do if I win this thing? Should I just have my resignation notice done and I can just walk up to the podium and say, well, thanks for believing in me, but here's my resignation notice <laughs> to the I'm entire out. industry. Like, what do you do? What do you do? And, and so we had that conversation and my dad's like, well, this girl thing is really working out. It's, you know, you have a lot of, a lot of following right now. And if there's anybody that can do it, you can do it. And when my dad says something like that, you listen. Right. And I'm like, I don't know, dad. I don't know. These girls, they just came out of nowhere. I don't know what's going to happen. You know, it could be just like one of the other projects. And it, it's just like a false, it's a false moment. Right. And I'm so done with the struggle and so done with all of this. And he's like, well, what are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. Two weeks later, we go on to win the Rebel Rally, the first ever Rebel Rally. Two weeks after that, I'm up in front of the Offred Motorsports Hall of Fame accepting the award for the impact in the industry category. Like, well, I guess we're going after the, <laughs> working with these girls because <laughs> I've canceled every other contract I have at this point <laughs> and on them help, right? So I've basically replaced myself in every company and that was the true beginning of Ladies Offered Network when I really put time, energy, and effort in to understanding what women want. And the first year was all about research and marketing and understanding what do these girls even want? Like, where did they come from? What is the need? What's happening out there? And for we just celebrated five years of Ladies Offered Network. Uh, and we've just been pretty much presenting that question every day <laughs> and how do we make rad programs for them to be successful um and you're so still the, doing challenges yeah we're just wrapping one up right now we're wrapping up our fifth annual sixth annual because six we yep. yeah because the first one wasn't even part of ladies off the network officially at the time so it's our sixth challenge we're wrapping up right now and it's changed in in the style. Instead of doing the co-driver situation, now it's uh, 11 challenges in 10 weeks that they have to do for themselves. And then the win is a top 10 weekend. So 10 girls get to come to my house for four days and I basically offer and spoil them. My house or LA or somewhere I take them. So it's pretty fun. Awesome. And then, yeah. so it's, so you started you started a convention as well, as part of yep. the so Ladies have, Off Road Network. Yeah, uh, the first weekend in August that will be our fifth annual Ladies Off Road Convention, which is four days, and it's all women uh, in a hotel environment. So when I started the convention. It was how do I eliminate all of the excuses? Uh, I don't like to camp. My it's my husband's vehicle. I don't want to drive it. Like, how do I eliminate all of these excuses? And so I'm like, oh, a hotel. That works out perfect. Like, I like showers all the time. It's awesome. <laughs> and so we have a hotel environment, which really, unless you understand me and unless you understand the bigger picture, you're like, how can I learn about off-roading in a hotel? And when you come and experience it and see it, you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe what I just took out of here in four days. Because much of it's hands-on and a lot of, there's so many things you can learn without being out on the trail. And then the friendships that you build off of it. And there's been, we now have lifetime memberships because it just became such a group of core women that were there for each other. They came together because of off-roading 
but now they're always going to stay together because they have that common interest and they've learned so much about each other and experienced so many great things together. So it's really evolved into something that I don't even have words for all the time, Rich. Like I'm still trying to figure out the words, but it's amazing. It's, it's the best thing I've ever done. And I love every day of my job uh, and coming up with the next cool thing to do with them and the next awesome way for them to learn something. Cause it's all, it's a hundred percent based around education and learning. And then of course that friendship comes with it. So it's a huge give back. Well, but. there was, there's a couple of things that I wanted to touch on that we haven't yet. Um, one, I was going to say, what are your most proud moments? But I think that you've probably explained those at least with the ladies off-road network and, and, you know, from, 2016 on but the other thing that that was was your four by four trainer cer- certificate and certification yeah. and then your racing racer marketing school yeah yeah so um through the certification there's been a few things i've pushed myself to do because i feel by Back before, everybody would say, hey, Charlene, can you teach me how to do this or teach me how to do that? And I never felt, not that I wasn't good enough, but I also felt like, hey, you need to go to a certified trainer that's going to teach you how to do it right. And I always used those words for anybody because the way I explain it now is Bubba learned from Bubba's dad who learned from Bubba's dad. And Bubba's dad grandpa was probably super smart at the time and knowing what he knew. And then he passed it on to Bubba's dad and probably didn't lose too much in interpretation, but maybe a little bit, you know, and then now Bubba learned it. Well, now Bubba's trying to teach you. And the unfortunate part about that process is the technology of vehicles now is so incredibly amazing that Bubba hardly knows all the buttons and how to use them, much less how to teach you how to do it correctly. And so I'm just really aware of that. And I always would say, hey, just find a certified trainer that can teach you correctly. That's all I'm asking, you know, invest in that. Well, then I started kind of getting forced into that position of having to be that person. Because of the Ladies Off-Road Network. Yeah, because of Ladies Off-Road Network. And I said, you're going to be a hypocrite if you start teaching and you're not certified. And so that was the very first thing on the list. And it was also part interesting. It was part of 36 Hours You Worry, where the I4WDTA, International Four-Wheel Drive Trainers Association, was the one that was hosting, part of hosting that event. And they sought me out. So I had already researched them, not knowing they were part of that event. Then they were there. They pulled me aside at the event saying, hey, we really want you to be a part of my of our organization. And I said, I just did research on you and I do too. This has to happen. Let's make this work. And so um, I became a certified four-wheel drive trainer. And 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 so we worked together as a team to make sure that is up to date on the most current information. And how to do this and hey, let's make sure that we're training this this way because they're a great group of guys and me and myself um, that are part of this group. So yeah, that's, that's super important. I also have been through multiple wilderness first aid, so first aid certifications. So one I did for myself because now I'm taking people out on trails and well, <laughs> let's yeah. be a little smarter than that. <laughs> and then I started doing the class for the girls, um, not me teaching it. I have another person that teaches it because I'm not that level. But uh, so I've gone through the class multiple times, just even being a host. So it's continuing to help me remember what's going on. Um, yeah. And then I do a lot of committee stuff as well. So I'm on the SEMA, SBN, SEMA Business Women Network Committee where we're really working with all the SEMA companies and helping the women be successful within their groups. Um, And then the other is the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame, super supportive of that. So as I mentioned, I was 2016 uh, 
industry rising star. And then 2018, I was honored with the Advocate Award for Women. Oh, excellent. By the Offred Motorsports Hall of Fame. So I think that those are the bullet points on that accolade list. <laughs> um, yeah. Are you still then, Are you still doing the racer marketing school? So the racer marketing school, um, yes and no. Okay. So it was very time time management because there's so much information and I talk this fast even and it's still five hours. Um, and so I started a, a program called Bauer Academy, which is an online schooling system. Good. And I have been working at putting the racer marketing school into that academy so that anybody can take it at any time. And it's about halfway done. And I've been working, continually working at it. But we run our challenges through that program now. And um, I also have a how to work on your four by four, all the basic maintenance items. I have a program in there for that. So you should see our academy coming out into the year first to next year. And then we'll have all those programs in it. Excellent. Excellent. And that'll be open to guys, girls, everybody. Like that's my way to, here's knowledge. Here's proper knowledge. Please come in the proper knowledge. Like we all use YouTube for education. I would lie if I didn't say I didn't use it also all the time. But is it right? And is our source correct? And so this is a situation where, yeah, you're going to have to pay a little bit, but guaranteed this is the way to do it correctly and safely. So good. Yeah, and then the racer marketing school is still a passion, just helping racers be successful through through all their marketing. I it's amazing because people will come up to me and go, "Oops, you know, hey, I've I've got a you know, I'm taking a picture. Somebody's taking a picture of their car, and they've got their window net out, you know, and they flip it in and said, oh, yeah. you know, Charlene would be mad at me.'" <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That makes that makes me so happy. It actually, and then the other thing happens is I start watching a like a live feed from somewhere, or at the King of the Hammers last year, I was walking the starting lines, right, and all these window nets were out, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been gone too long. These boys need to get in shape around here. <laughs> Uh, yep. <laughs> so for anybody that's listening right now and you don't understand what we're talking about here's your pro tip for the day and how you can help your friends when your window net is out and it is flopped out of the car 90% of the time your main sponsor is right there on your door panel and you are covering your main sponsor partner toss that window net in so people are taking pictures of your car up and down wherever you are that that main sponsor is getting as much pop as possible. Exactly. For a reason. Every time that window <laughs> net is down, it needs to be down on the inside of the vehicle, not inside on the outside. Inside of the vehicle. Correct. Yep. And if you have window <laughs> nets on both sides, make sure they're both in. Same thing. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I well, love it. Is there, That's awesome. <laughs> is there anything that you can think of that we haven't touched bases on? I don't know. I appreciate you for letting me ramble. Oh, no, it's been great. It's been great. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask, but I didn't I was write say, it this down. This is my story, but you have a lot of stories for me, too. Well. The... We kept it on the PG tonight. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's a good thing. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this this might get us out of that. Um, Baja. Oh. oh, Baja. The trip where you went down and you had Little Rich. Eric Anderson and Jesse oh, Combs with you. Oh my God. I don't know if I can tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you kept, you guys so kept little died. rich out of jail, right? <laughs> oh my God. Yes, I did. In La Paz. So none of us died. <laughs> uh, the truck came back in one piece, but I just saw a little rich admit after multiple years that something was wrong with the truck and Lance never even knew about it. <laughs> um, we laughed so hard. We were completely delirious because it was a point to point race. So it was a point to point race. 
Lance was Roger Norman. And, yep. yep. So Roger Norman was a trophy truck, and it was a point to point race. Lance Clifford, Pirate Four by Four, was co driving, and uh, they were the chase team. And I was responsible for running all of the Pirate Four by Four live coverage of the Baja One Thousand, which nobody understands. Number one, how difficult it is to run live coverage. How difficult it is to run live co- coverage in a country like Mexico with no internet or anything else. And then the the degree of which we were running live coverage at the time was unheard of. Like we were streaming, we were getting videos up, we were getting pictures up. It was it was an awesome time in live coverage and just pushing the boundaries. Lance would always push the boundaries. And I'd be like, okay. He's like, this is what we need. I'm like, okay. Uh, I can do that. Like, I can do it, but I need the team to be doing it too. So Little Rich was our driver, and uh, Mustard Dog, Eric Anderson, was part of that team and being a part of the driver, driver situation and everything. Security. And somehow Jesse Combs got into the truck too. I don't remember how exactly she wound up. I think it just became like a, hey, Jesse needs a ride. Let's take her with us. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. Um, and to explain Jesse and Maya's relationship for people that don't understand, like we've been friends for a long time. And we always laugh because we would talk in the background and we, there's very few girls that you can talk to and relate to the off-road industry and understand what's going on and understand also the challenges of being in the light of everybody, right? Like right. what you do matters and how you act represents not just ourselves, but girls in the whole industry and et cetera. So her and I had a great relationship and, our teasing thing was, Baja was one of them. <laughs> We've slept in more beds together than we had boyfriends, right? <laughs> <laughs> we would always end up like in Baja. Here we are, two girls. We were in the same bed together all the time. <laughs> and uh, a lot of our trips were like that. We were always doing weird stuff. So this was one of those times. And yes, the chaos was real. I can't really tell all the stories. It probably definitely would not be a good thing, but there is a video out there from Mustard Dog. It surfaces about every year. He pops it on the internet that we put together of us racing down this one little road because he can't race and it's hysterical. Um, Jesse, we kept in control. She's, she's like a little blonde that just runs all over the pits and I'm like, Oh my God, get in the truck. We got to go. And, um, <laughs> Yes, Rich got super drunk after not sleeping for two days when we got to the finish line at the celebration party. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I had to do some fast talking to in keep English. Him out of jail. I, refused to, <laughs> I refused to speak Spanish to the cops and uh, did some fast movements and some embarrassing moments for Little Rich, but we kept him out of jail. And it's forever our laugh. Like it's hysterical. So even I hired Rich to Little Rich to take me down to Mexico after that, and and another trip that we had as a driver. Awesome. And, oh my God, he almost ended up in jail again. I'm like, what is your thing, dude? Like, why do I have to keep you out of jail all the time? So now that's our running joke. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, Shelly and I <laughs> ran from the cops in oh, Mexico. Oh, you just ran from them. Yeah, we just took off. It was. Oh, it was, it, it's a story I'll have to tell you the next time we're together. It's uh, it okay. happened out of uh, Scorpion Bay, but we uh, we took off across down the racetrack. And once I got to the racetrack, I knew that, uh, knew oh, that they were weren't going to be point. following me at that point. Went yeah. through La Parisma and then over to Buena Ventura. And then that's when Shelly stepped on the on the stingray. And oh, my God, yes. it, it turned into one of those. Oh, my gosh. But, you know. You know how Mexico yeah, is. Yeah, turned into Baja. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Baja happened. <laughs> Baja happened. Yes. Well, Charlene, what's... Yeah, there's so many stories from Baja that shouldn't come back. <laughs> is there anything on the horizon that you can share? Um, Ladies Offer Network is going to continue to just keep kicking ass for women in the industry. I 
love it. Uh, we're not going anywhere. Uh, I had a, I had an opportunity, you know, here we go again, right? I had an opportunity to quit in 2020 when everything crashed. And again, here's my, here's my business ladies offer network that's built around being at events and there's not an event to be at. Right. Uh, and so I sat there, well, I took a nap first for like a week <clears throat> and then I woke up and I said, okay, what are we going to do about this? Like either you have an opportunity to walk away right now and nobody's going to blame you. And a lot of companies did that. Fair enough. Yep. And nobody can blame them. Or you can look at your picture and how can you rework this picture to make it where it's successful for people. And so I made it successful for people and we turned everything that we were doing to an online phase. And the number of women that have reached out to me during that and said, you're, you being consistent online every week and having these opportunities for us is what allowed me to be seen through the whole 2020 lockdown. Right. When, when everybody was feeling alone. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we you, maybe you were, together. maybe they had their family. I laughed. Right. But they didn't have their environments. Right. Right. And I mean, those are heavy words. Those are big words. Yeah. Uh, and, <clears throat> and at that point when I, when I made that decision to turn it to online, I also made a decision to come out with lifetime membership. And I said, here's my commitment to you right now. We're not going anywhere. So if you want to become a lifetime member, here's how to do it. And if you don't, no stress. Like, it doesn't even matter if you remember for most all of our stuff. It's just cost savings everywhere. Um, and let's let's have some fun. And let's be stuck with it forever. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, there are a lot of girls I'm stuck with forever. I don't know who, I think they're worse off. They're stuck with me. <laughs> I don't think they think so. <laughs> yeah, so we have, um, I have some trainings coming up. We did a, in 2019, I did, I went back out on the road. That's what you were trying to have me say at one point. Yep. And, I did go back out on the road in 2019. 2018, I took one month, and all the people on the East Coast that said, oh, ladies off our networks, the West Coast, they never come to the East Coast. I called them out and came to the East Coast for a month in 2018. Uh, did 24 stops at four-wheel parts for the five-hour class, and it proved to be really well-received. And so uh, in 2019, when my life changed and I had a release of time. I just said, you know what? I'm going to go on the road this year. Buy a diesel pusher <laughs> and hooked up my, my trailer and my Jeep to the diesel pusher. And off I went for six months and did 75 stops around the country at foil parts, teaching a five hour class to thousands of women and men. There are men that come to the class as well. It was hugely rewarding and amazing. So, I don't foresee that in the future again, but we are doing <laughs> smaller, I was gonna smaller ask. little tours. <laughs> yeah, that was very aggressive. That was a very aggressive moment in time, but it worked and it was great for the business and it was great for the girls and it was great for everybody. Right. So the, um, but yeah, there's always something in the horizon. Always something interesting up my sleeve. The Good. Bauer Academy, I think, is the biggest one where finally I can bring the education to the men as well. They've been they've been wanting it and I appreciate that and um and I want to give it as well and I want to give it in a way where everybody can be successful. So And I and I think online is a great way to do that. Um Yeah. For the simple fact that you can do it once you get it done, then it's the same thing for everybody. And then yeah. you just have to update it as things as things change, but you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to do it individually five hours, a, you know, once a month or something like that. So, I think in the long run, it's 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 much better. Yeah, and we've been testing it with our challenge challenges and how the girls are kind of manipulating their way through it and what works and what doesn't work through this program that I've been using. Okay, and so I've. 
really successful about being able to put a big program together now and be able to, like you said, just leave it out there and let it continue to educate people. Um, but each one of those programs still comes with personal time with me. Oh, well, that's like good. the racer marketing school. You know, if you do the racer marketing school online, you still get an hour with me at the end and saying, okay, let's talk about you direct. Like what's your, you know, let's do your one-on-one -on -one with your specific information. Now that you've learned all this and you know the questions I'm going to ask and you know what needs to be expected of you, how can we put your program together? Perfect. So, yeah. So there's still the personalization to it. I think you, I don't want to lose that. That's my hardest part about going online. Right. And probably why I fight it is because I just, I love being with the people and how can I answer you? your question and make it right for you because at the end of the day that's that's what's going to be the best element for them perfect i think that's uh i think that's a great place to to call it quits on this conversation i i think you, you've brought a lot of information um not only about yourself but what you're doing now with the ladies off-road network and the challenges and and the convention and everything and i think that's uh I think that all the ladies out there, I'm going to say this, men, if you have a girlfriend or a wife that you want more involved with off-road, have her check out the Ladies Off-Road Network. Yeah. Yeah, and, and even the ladies that are, that are high, high, high educated or have lots of time right. in off-roading, um, they love Ladies Off-Road Network also because it's their people you know it's the people that understand what they're actually saying now instead of just sitting around talking about nails yep um so it's it's your people it's there's a bunch of girls that are high level operators that are part of it and you know you i'm pushing you too there's places where i can push that lady as much as i can make sure a brand new lady doesn't feel overwhelmed um in event series and um and then just knowing you have those people behind you to talk to is a really cool element as well. Exactly. But yep. I do Excellent. have one more thing to add. Are you ready? Yes. I have to thank you and Shelly for, and Little Rich for everything that you guys have done for me as well. But you are one of the guys, when I talk men that have supported women in the industry to make sure that I have been successful and I have raised up to where I've been. You're absolutely one of them. And when Shelly became part of your team, she became part of my team as well. And that has just been a huge element. And Shelly has pushed me in different categories, which is always fun. Um, but I just really appreciate both of you guys and what you have also put into this industry and what you've given to me personally. So well, there's, it's there's a lot of history there. Yes. And I love every every moment of it has been rewarding for me and I hope it has been as entertaining for you. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Entertaining is one way yes. to put it. Yes. No, it's been <laughs> it's been great and thank you thank you for that. Um you know, we we love I got into this whole thing cuz I love the sport. And then yep. I became, exactly. I, I loved the people that were involved in the sport and I didn't want to see the sport disappear and the companies that, that, uh, that were, that got it, you know, that, that grew because of the sport of, you know, especially rock crawling. And I just, you know, I don't ever want to see it go away, the sport or, you know, the, the rock crawling or four wheel drive off road, any of that. But, uh, yeah. you know, eventually things will change for, for me or us. And, you know, that'll, uh, you know, like I tell everybody, I've been doing this for 21 years. I'm 63. You do the math. I'm not going to be doing it at yeah. 84. It just ain't going to happen. Yeah. So, you know, eventually, um, you know, somebody else will have to pick up the reins and we'll see when that happens. So. Yeah. So I tell people, um, well, my numbers are 27 years this year okay. in the offered industry working in, in every category. And people don't realize that until you hear the story like today. 
Yep. Um, so 27 years working in the off-road industry, 12 years as Bauer Media, nine with I'm Not Just a Girl, and now five as Ladies Off-Road Network. And um, it's, it's so rewarding. And yes, I absolutely buy this blonde a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It's rewarding and it's also the most challenging thing I think I've ever done in my life. But yes. um but it's worth it's it's worth it and I continue to tell myself that and as you know and and I think you do the same thing like you're rewarded by people telling you what a great experience they had at your events and that because of them competing at your event this happened or that happened. I've watched you like you're rewarded by that. That's what yes. gets continues to make you come back. Right. It's for us. It's not about the money. Let's be real about this. And that's the same way that I am too. Like I'm rewarded when a girl texts me and says, I made it off the Eugene pass with it raining. My husband put me in the driver's seat because I had more experience than he did at that point. And I told him what I needed because I took your class and I knew what I needed. Like that's rewarding, you know, knowing that you're giving people the tools to be successful and the, the life experiences to be awesome. And that's what you do as well. So as we always say, to each other, keep it up. Hashtag never bored. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you again thank you. for, for coming on board and, being a, and agreeing to being a guest on here and sharing things that you hadn't shared before. So I appreciate that. It's, uh, yep, I think that's, that's the first refreshing. time anybody really heard I was going to quit then. Yeah. I, I've told it locally, but not nationally. So right. And I've, I've heard it. I mean, cause we were one of yeah. your clients, so. You yeah. were part of it. Yep. Well, Charlene, I want to say thank you again and may all of your endeavors be successful for whatever you try to do. And I hope that you're able to keep the Ladies Off-Road Network fresh and moving forward because there's a lot of ladies out there that uh, that need to find out about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm excited to meet them. I'm the lucky one. I get to meet all of them. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Rich. I appreciate you. Okay. Talk to you later. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a rating. Share some feedback with us via Facebook or Instagram and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much.